This is episode 65 of the Life in Norway show. Norway is known worldwide as a great destination for discovering the great outdoors. Today I'm joined by Kevin J. Rosenberg from IAG Adventures. He's an American tour guide living here in Trondheim and is here today to talk about all things adventure travel in Norway. You can find out more information about Kevin and everything we talk about today on the show notes page. Head on over to lifeinnorway.net slash podcast and look for episode 65. Happy listening. I'm joined today by Kevin Rosenberg, an American travel guide living here in Trondheim, Norway. He's the founder of IAG Adventures and is here today to talk about adventure travel in Norway. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, David. It's uh, great to be here in Trondheim. So an American accent in Norway, it's not the rarest <laughs> thing, but it's fairly uncommon still to hear an American accent of someone living here in Trondheim. So what brings you to Norway? Well, I first came to Norway in 2015 to scout out an adventure in uh, in Jotunheim in, uh, National Park. And I uh, just really fell in love with the place. And um uh, in particular, the culture of, of being outdoors and how much the outdoors is a part of, of the lifestyle here. And it's just incredibly beautiful. I just want to keep exploring and, and have the time to do so. Okay, so we're going to talk about adventure travel today. This is something you do, your company does. It leads uh, adventure travel tours, not just in Norway, but around Northern Europe. Before we get into the detail, though, when we say adventure travel, what is it we're actually talking about? What, what do you mean by adventure travel? So first of all, I'm a mountain guide and a kayak guide. And um, basically, we do adventure travel to Iceland, Greenland, Norway, Sweden, uh, the Faroe Islands in the USA. And we're adding uh, Denmark next year and uh, Finland Finland in the next year or two. Now, adventure travel can sound kind of scary. And it's really, it's a different thing for different people. There's different levels of adventure and there's kind of an adventure for everybody. Basically, it's it's an active vacation. So not that you're going to miss out on the traditional tourist spot necessarily, but the focus is going to be some kind of outdoor adventure activity, hiking, trekking, kayaking, it could be horseback riding or cycling, but some something outdoors. So we're not necessarily talking, you know, mountain climbing here. Uh, it, it could cover that, but it could also cover a day long hike, for example. Sure. I mean, my 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 uh, my favorite adventure is the one we do in Greenland. One of the ones we do in Greenland, where we actually start by landing craft. We hit the beach, we bushwhack for a few miles, and we trek west for four days, uh, heading back to the coast. And we're carrying everything we need uh, on our on our backs for the for those four days. Uh, but we also have uh, you know that's not the adventure for everybody, and everyone needs to be pushed beyond their comfort zone, but not so far beyond their comfort zone. Uh, so we also have a lot of ho- adventures that are hotel based where it might be uh, going for a hike and then, you know, going for a nice dinner in a hotel room uh, or some kind of other adventure like that. But uh, it's, it changes. We have a different, we have a varying uh, catalog of adventures that there's something for everybody. Some are family friendly, some are not, but um, yeah, just basically pushing it beyond your comfort zone, keeping you active and really experience, experiencing the, um, the nature and the culture of, of a destination. So you've chosen to base yourself here in Norway, at least for the time being. Um, we are an, an outdoors nation. Uh, it's a very much a, a country of hikers and skiers and um, kayakers and cyclists and so on. Um, but, but what is it about Norway that you think makes it so attractive as a, as a destination for people coming here? Well, it's, it's in many ways, it's uniquely beautiful. I mean, the fjords, the mountains, and, and there's some varying terrain as well. I mean, uh, in Jotunheim, in one day, we can be up in, in mountains with glaciers around us and kind of a, a sparse landscape. And we descend down into a lush valley with these like teal, blue, bluish green waters from coming off the glacier. Um, it's really an amazing place. And I think that energy, that, that uh, enthusiasm for the outdoors really comes through in the country and just you catch that when you're here. It just makes you want to spend more time outdoors when you're here uh, with Norwegians. Getting into a bit more detail then on on, on places, you mentioned Jordanheim at, at the beginning. Um, what are your favorite places for adventure travel in Norway and why? So uh, Jordanheim is definitely the area 
that's probably one of my favorites and the one I also have the most experience with. But I recently had a chance to go up to a Lofoten and I'm doing some guiding up there uh, at the end of the month as well. And it's just amazingly like postcard beautiful, uh, almost wherever you are. It, it's an amazing place. Um, there hasn't been an area uh, in Norway that I haven't been impressed by. I even did um, kind of leapfrogged on the pilgrim trail from Oslo to Trondheim, which is the first time I the first time I arrived in Trondheim. I literally walked into town from the mountains, which is definitely the way you want to arrive in this kind of a city. Um, but wherever you are, you, you see a varying, you know, levels of, uh, of terrain and, and some higher mountains and, and places than others. And even away from the fjords, you know, you're going to be impressed by the nature in, in Norway. Um, yeah, it's just a beautiful place. So for listeners that don't know Jordanheim, it's a national park in pretty much in the center of, of Norway uh, or the center of southern Norway anyway. Um, it's home to most of Norway's tallest mountains, I think. Um, but it, it's not just about mountain climbing in, in that region. No, and it literally it literally means home of the giants. And, and the name comes from uh I think a folk tale. I forgot the author's name, but his house is is near one of the huts in um in Newtonheim near Fonsbu hut. But um no the DNT, the Norwegian Tracking Association, which you if you're interested in Norway and haven't really learned about yet, you should definitely check out uh their website. Um just look Google DNT or Norwegian Tracking Association. They have an amazing uh system of huts all throughout Norway. And I think in Jotunheim in particular, it's really impressive. Uh, some are full service where they can have a bar and a restaurant and hot showers and even drying rooms for your gear. Some are self-service where you, um, you, they have, they're stocked with food. Uh, they, they have like bedding, everything else you need, but, um, well, you bring your own sleeping bag or liner, but they have everything you need for purchase on the honor system, even wood chop for the stoves that, that heat the, heat the, uh, huts. Um, and then um, the self-service huts where you have to have the key to be a member, have the key to get into them. And then they have still have cooking gas and everything else you need. Um, but it's an amazing, amazing place. So you don't need to just be mountain climbing there. There are glaciers or glacial lakes. Uh, there's so much to see and do there. Um, even you can go on some of these huts and just do day hikes based from the hut. Uh, we do a hut to hut trek. Um, some people would go across the glaciers. There's just, it's just boundless opportunities in a really spectacularly beautiful place. I'm glad you mentioned the the DNT network of of huts and so on. And um, so many people in Norway, I'm not actually sure how many, maybe 5%, maybe even 10% of people are members, mm. um, which entitles them to, to use this network of cabins. As someone who has uh, traveled extensively and run tours in, in other countries, uh, I've gotten used to the DNT system. To me, it feels completely normal now, but it is... It's pretty unique. Is, is there any other country you know of that has a, a similar system? So it is very unique, um, especially coming from the U.S. Uh, you know, the U.S. is really mostly primitive nature. It's mostly primitive camping where you're carrying a tent and everything you need on your back. There are some places where you might have some more infrastructure available, but um, uh, like New Hampshire and the White Mountains, there's the AMC, the Appalachian Mountain Club, which also has a series of huts uh, similar in concept to uh, the Norwegian, to the DNT, to the Norwegian Trekking Association, but not nowhere near as nice. Uh, the only other country that really um, uh, comes close is Iceland as a hut system as well. Uh, there are more several smaller organizations that have some areas they cover with huts, but, um, uh, but again, nowhere near as nice as the huts in Norway. I've never seen a hut in, in the Nordic region, any other country, the Nordic region that has a bar and a restaurant. And, you know, it's really, it's a great thing to, to be out in the cold, maybe all day and, and hiking and in the weather. And then you get into this hut and you have a beer and a hot meal waiting for you. You mentioned the pilgrimage trail earlier, and I didn't actually know that that's how you arrived in Trondheim. That's a great story. Um, St. Olaf's Ways, I think they're called in English, the, the, the pilgrim trails here to Nidaros Cathedral in, in Trondheim. Um, can you tell us a bit more about those? Because so many people actually come to Norway specifically to hike at least part of those routes. Um, and even though that's it can be a fairly easy walk, there, there are hotels and hostels and things along the way, it's still very much an adventure travel experience. Yeah, I think um, part of the adventure is knowing that you're walking paths that have been walked for hundreds of years. I believe people started walking them in the 11, 1200s. And there's a couple of the uh, farm stays you can do, uh, stay at. They're almost like um, like a bed and breakfast, so to speak, um, with more of a restaurant than you'd think of a B&B &B in the U.S. Um, 
where you have the option to stay in the traditional pilgrims' quarters that have been used for hundreds of years. They're obviously renovated for safety and and uh, cleanliness and that kind of stuff. And uh, but you have the option of kind of living like a pilgrim or in more modern accommodations. But it's just fascinating to think of the um, the history of how many people have come before you on the same path and and seen the same mountains and views that you're, you're seeing now. Um, and you could, um, we're actually, I'm actually putting together an adventure. We're going to be kind of leapfrogging. It's a couple of days in Oslo. I will be leapfrogging uh, along the trail for four days to get to Trondheim and spend some time in Trondheim as well. But I think you can actually start if you wanted to in Germany and walk the entire path. Um, next to Niederos Cathedral, there's the, um, the Pilgrim Trail, um, a society or, or agency that kind of promotes it and, and organizes it. And they'll even issue you a little passport. You can kind of get stamped along the way. They'll uh, give you a little um, kind of a wooden placard you can have in your backpack to show you're hiking the trail. And they really help you plan the trip. And they uh, they just do a great, uh, great support agency and a great resource if you want to hike the Pilgrim Trails on your own. Thinking about a, a lot of people's idea of a, a vacation here in Europe, it might be heading to the south of Spain to a beach. Uh, for an American, it might be heading south to a beach resort in Mexico. Um, for that kind of person, the, the term adventure travel might seem daunting. Uh, you've already said it, the best way to describe it is, is as an active vacation. Um, how active do you need to be for an adventure travel experience here in Norway? Yeah, so there's, again, there's varying levels of adventures. Um, in terms of how active or how how fit, um, I kind of feel like as long as you're not a couch potato, if that term carries over to Europe, uh, the Americans will understand that, um, you're going to be fine. You know, you don't have to be an athlete. Um, well, there's some trips that are more strenuous and we'll kind of screen, talk to you with that in advance of, uh, with our trips at least, of what is appropriate for you. But uh, as long as you can walk like a mile an hour for, um, or 1.6 kilometers an hour, for at least three hours straight, you can do just by, just the, the soft adventures, at least the hotel based adventures. Um, there's different levels of intensity, but you can also see a lot by kayaking. Um, if someone was maybe less able than that, or maybe had some disabilities, um, I think there are some coach tours available. I know that in Iceland we do ATV tours, and, and in Norway they'll they'll have snowmobile tours or snow machine tours. So that'd be a good way to kind of have an adventure and see, really get into nature. Um, that's the goal is to really get you to see something unique. Uh, I think the um, first time visitor to Europe might want to go to the Mediterranean or maybe go to Paris or London. But after that, if you're, once you kind of catch the travel bug and you want something unique, you want to really see and experience a country or experience Europe, then you, that, that's what draws you to adventure travel. Uh, that's what, especially Norway, where it's just, uh, it's just in some of the most beautiful nature in all of Europe. Um, and adding on to what I talked about earlier as to why I'm here, I really, I really want to develop Norway as a, a really a primary destination for adventure travel for Americans coming to Europe. I think it's just a perfect match. A lot of the websites for hikes in, in Norway, in Norwegian, they have a kind of ranking system for how difficult the, the hike is. And it's always tickled me that it's a perspective thing because Norwegians are so used to being outdoors that their rankings are completely skewed. So what they call an easy hike is is anything but for someone who's visiting the country maybe. And I've experienced that. Um, I've been invited on a short walk before and I expected 10 to 15 minutes down to the lake, take some pictures. Three hours later, we were still out and uh, you know there was no sign of any food or, or anything. And um, so with that in mind, do you, do you have any kind of um, ranking system on your tours for, for how intense they go and, and experience they're going to be? Yeah. So on our tours, we definitely rank them uh, easy, moderate, and strenuous. Uh, there's no skill level required. You know, um, my guides are all very experienced. Uh, I'm a veteran. I'm a former naval officer myself, and uh, I, I'm a wilderness EMT. I teach survival. I teach uh, land navigation. Most of my guides are veterans as well. Um, so we have all the all the skills and experience and background to uh, to teach you what you need to know and keep you safe. It's more about the physical level of exertion. Um, that could be um, maybe not that there's a lot of elevation gain or a long distance, but maybe the terrain's just rough. Maybe there's a lot of rocks or mud or something like that. Um, 
you know, in, in a moderate trip, most of our trips are going to be moderate. So there's going to be some elevation gain. You're not walking on a sidewalk. So if you're thinking like, hey, I walked 10 miles in a city that's flat, that's nowhere near as easy. Uh, that's that's much easier than um, walking 10 miles in, in, the, in the mountains and in the, in the woods. So um, generally, uh, I try to plan our trips that um, if people are walking a mile an hour, 1.6K an hour, they'll get done before the sun comes down, basically, uh, or before they get too exhausted. So we um, generally, we won't, even the backpacking trips, we generally won't go over 10 miles or 16K a day. There are some exceptions where it's just slightly over that just because we have to get to a certain spot. And those are the more strenuous trips. Um, on our, our hotel-based kind of softer adventures, generally it's going to be three to six miles of hiking if you know around that time and not every day. Uh, so one day might be um, hiking, one day might be horseback riding, one day might be riding ATVs. So, and we also do like to include the more traditional tourist activities as well. So you get those in as well. If you're looking at those websites, uh, planning your own trip to Norway and trying to figure out what you can do, I, I would keep that same advice. I would plan for one mile an hour or 1.6 kilometers an hour. Look at the elevation gain and loss. Um, that's going to be really critical as well. It's going to slow you down, especially if you're not used to uh, used to that. Um, if you'd like, I can go over kind of like what people should do to prepare for hikes as well. But um, um, you know, something like um, if you have a lot of elevation gain, and you're going to be carrying a pack, maybe doing a hut to hut trek carry everything in your backpack that you're going to be using on the trip and go up and down stairs in a building up and down, maybe on your lunch break uh, and kind of get a sense of uh, what it's going to feel like not to carry that, that weight, you know, just down a sidewalk, but up and down. And that's going to help you train, build those muscles up. I've had people on hikes who are triathletes, but they never really hiked much. So they really find the up and down, the uneven terrain of carrying and carrying a backpack to be a challenge that they're not used to. They had those muscles haven't really been awakened in their body. So it's important if you're not a hiker, but planning a hiking trip that you uh, kind of plan ahead, get in shape, awaken those muscles, and then you'll have a great trip. There will be people listening, I know, that are super keen to see that side of Norway, experience Norwegian nature. But the thought of a multi-day trip, even the softer kind where you're staying in hotels in the evening and the kind of luxury environment just isn't for them. Um, do you have any tips for that kind of person to incorporate even a small little bit of adventure into their trip to Norway? So uh, if you're looking to kind of uh, get some get some outdoor adventure in or maybe, you know, start you know, getting into the outdoor adventure world, I think a great option in Norway is some of these uh, smaller family-owned hotels. Uh, there's even a historic uh, hotel network, I believe. And uh, some of these country inns will give you um, lodging in nature, often with a hiking trail starting at the doorway to the hotel. Uh, so that gives you a, a, you can do some short hikes in, in fantastic nature and then come back to a, a really comfortable environment. Uh, even even Trondheim, I mean, there's there's hiking trails around here, so you could be, uh, you know, enjoying the city and, and staying in a nice hotel, and still get um, get some hikes in in nature. There's uh, Trondheim kayak; uh, you can go kayaking through the uh, through the river over here, which is a beautiful way to see uh, the city. There's there's a lot of opportunities for outdoor adventure. Uh, recently, I just met with some people who are putting together some bike tours in the area. Um, so I, I feel like it's it's harder to avoid outdoor adventure in Norway than to find it. That's a really good point, especially with the cities. Um, here in Trondheim, you have the tram that goes all the way up into the forest where there's a lake. That's an easy half an hour walk. Mm. Uh, in Bergen, so many people take the funicular railway up to Mount Flynn and then they come straight back down again. But when you're up there, there's some very easy hikes, less than an hour, and you're, you're in a spot all on your own with a completely different view of the city. Um, and you've had that nature experience and then, but you're back in your hotel an, an hour later. So yeah, there really is, I think a, a lot of opportunity for people to, to get that little bit of adventure, even if they don't want to join a, um, a multi-day organized, uh, trip. Something you've touched on Kevin is, um, with, with, with the pilgrim trails is a, a kind of cultural experience as well as adventure travel. It, it's not just about mountain climbing and, and seeing these spectacular fjords and so on. Um, there is very much a cultural element to adventure travel as well. 
Absolutely. And uh, with my company, we focus on um, kind of small groups, uh, unique itineraries, and intimate local, local cultural experiences. We want you to really meet the locals and experience their life and learn about the culture. Now, uh, in Norway, there are um, it's more than one culture, obviously. You have the Norwegian culture, which I think we can experience on the Pilgrim Trail, and also um, even the DNT huts where you're um, spending time with Norwegians uh, in a relaxed environment. Um, you know, one of my first times in my first time in Jotunheim, and I remember uh, I it was no one in the hut, and finally this Norwegian couple showed up, and I was asking a lot of questions about Norway. About Norway was my first time here. And the funniest thing I remember asking is, um, so what's this Norge thing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he laughed, obviously, and, and, and you know, I kind of figured it was it was I was probably getting it wrong because no, it's Norway, it's like USA, it's like the you know, the short way of saying Norway. But uh, you know, first time in Norway, I kept seeing Norge everywhere, and I'm like, I don't I don't get it. But yeah, so you get to have those experiences, you know, share stories. Um, you know, I'm a veteran in the U.S. He had been a paratrooper in the Norwegian Army, so it was it was nice to kind of share those experiences. But um, I think also fascinating is the uh, the native culture of uh, of northern Norway of the Sami people. And um, they are really, um, uh, really proud of their culture. And they're also um, very open to sharing and, and teaching and, and uh, letting you experience uh, what their culture is all about and, and what their lives are like today and, and also the folklore. So, um, you know, everyone does the, uh, I think first time in Norway, people often do the Norway in a nutshell tour, you know, the Oslo, Bergen, you know, Flom tour, uh, which is great. It's, you know, again, I haven't been to a spot in Norway that hasn't been spectacularly beautiful. You're going to have a great time. But um, I think maybe, I think it's important to, if you have the time and resources, maybe add on a trip to the north. Um, maybe go up to Alta and, um, and you know, ex explore the northern uh, area of, of Norway and, uh, you know, get to experience uh, the Sami life as well. And um, there's a lot, we're actually, I'm looking to add a trip there because, again, uh, supporting and, and also experiencing local culture is something that we really pride ourselves on. So um, trying, I met with a couple of uh, Sami uh, guides and tour operators to kind of figure out how we're going to incorporate them. But um, it, it's a great thing to highlight to really uh, to learn about the world. Many of your fellow countrymen and countrywomen, they don't come to Europe just to come to Norway and spend some time touring the rest of uh, Northern Europe in particular. And you've spent a lot of time elsewhere in, in the Nordic region as well. So what are some of your favorite spots for adventure travel in, in the north? And my guess is you're probably going to start with Iceland. Uh, Iceland is amazing. Uh, there's so much to uh, see there. And I did literally start with Iceland. That was our first uh, overseas trip. We did the um, started doing the, uh, the Lugavegger trek, which means Hot Springs Road. Uh, it's a trail that's on uh, National Geographic's top 20 best hikes in the world. Uh I kind of like to say we, we we did Iceland before it was cool, but uh, so it's a little challenging. I actually reserved the huts on that trail now a year and a half in advance to make sure we actually get into them. Um, and Iceland is is getting increasingly crowded, but um, they, uh, especially this year with people who who canceled in 2020 and 2021, uh, rescheduling for 2022, along with people who just wanted to travel this year. But most of those tourists stay in and around the area of Reykjavik. So if you if you leave Reykjavik, it's a great. There's so much to see in Iceland and so much more to see. Um, but I, honestly, my favorite place to explore is Greenland. Uh, you just it's an amazing place. It's literally the si almost the size of Mexico with a population of fifty seven thousand people. And even then, you have like three cultures almost within the country. You have three different dialects. One that is almost you know unrecognizable uh, from the other from the other two. Um, the people are just, it's, it's fascinating to think that this one culture has been there for thousands of years in such a harsh environment that even honestly, the Vikings couldn't, uh, couldn't tolerate it without adapting the way the, uh, the Inuit did. Um, it's the home, you know, the Inuit invented the kayak. It's, it's, uh, it's just an amazing place. And the first time I was there hiking on the Arctic circle trail, um, which I was doing at the edge of winter, it was mid September, early September. And, uh, I was carrying, I was planning on doing it in eight days carrying nine days of food just in case because yeah, I didn't know if rescue was even an option. I was kind of looking at it as being, I have to be entirely self-sufficient. But the coolest thing I remember is the first four days, I didn't see a single person. It was just me and the reindeer and literally Arctic hair, you know, rabbits almost like the size of cats and dogs. It's huge, more like small dogs, uh, just gigantic uh, Arctic hair. Um, 
you know, it's just it's just a fascinating place. You just it's you just feel like you're an explorer, like you're a pioneer when you're in Greenland, and it's just that's what I, I kind of uh, that's always my goal, my dream. Okay, Kevin, I'm going to try a, a quick game with you now. I'm going to give you the name of a Nordic country, and I want you to give me very quick two or three words max. What's the best thing to do in that country? We'll start with Norway. Uh, it's got to be uh, hiking in the uh, mountains. Sweden. Uh, sea kayaking. Denmark. Cycling in Newland. Finland. Finland's. It's got to be the, um, the Northern Lights by dog sled. The Faroe Islands. Culinary tour. Uh, where haven't we been yet? Iceland. Uh, that's going to be the uh, the Lugavigger trek. And Greenland. Hiking the Arctic Circle. Okay, that's yeah. that worked pretty well. Thank you very much. That's a good whistle stop tour of the Nordic region, or at least most of the Nordic region. I'm sure I've missed some places out there. Um, we haven't really talked much about Trondheim yet, Kevin. You you find yourself here as a as a newly adopted local. Um, how has the experience been of not just visiting Trondheim, but actually having to live here? That you know, be here every day, get up, have your breakfast here, go to bed here. What what is Trondheim like to to be uh, to be living in over the long term? Uh, I'm really loving it here. The uh, the reason I chose Trondheim is, um, uh, you know, when I was here the first time, I was really impressed that it had everything you want in the city. It had great restaurants. I mean, things like five Michelin star restaurants or so in in the city. Um, it's a great food culture. There's there's nice architecture. It's an arch- architecturally significant buildings around, and great culture and you know entertainment, music, theater. But it's not crowded, and you have nature all around. You don't feel like Oh, I'm in a city and just kind of feel that that kind of burden and that like you know that feeling of I want to get out of here, I want to escape. Uh it's very pleasant. Um some funny things in the grocery store though. I do love the uh the fish burger aisle. I took a picture of that, which is and they're actually tasty, but that was kind of funny. It's something we don't have in the US. Um I found uh I'm originally from New York. I'm from Brooklyn originally. I've lived in like half the states. Uh so uh definitely a, a fan of of bagels in the morning. I did find frozen bagels, and I thought it was kind of funny that they were labeled as uh, the American way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I always thought it was more the New York way or the Brooklyn way, but okay. Um, and the funniest thing I saw was I was walking past the frozen vegetable aisle and uh, looked down, and I saw a product that looked like it was called Pandemics, <laughs> which I thought was a pretty poor name for a food product if you want to sell it. Uh, kind of felt like, okay, I've had enough of that product, you know, but um, I asked some Norwegians, and apparently it's a Danish product. Uh, they pronounce it as panda mix or pan mix. It's like a rice and vegetable thing. But uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of a funny experience. Um, but everyone's been very friendly. Um, I always joke with the Norwegians, they often speak English better than we do. So yeah, I'm trying to learn Norwegian. And my favorite word, so my favorite phrase so far is cafe pausa or coffee break. It just makes sense in English as well. You know, coffee pause, so easy to remember. Um yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Everyone's really friendly. Um, I haven't had to experience the the long nights yet, you know, the dark days. So uh, easy for me to say so now, but uh, I'm really loving being here. That's true. I mean, as we speak now, we're just a couple of weeks away from the longest day of the year, and it's uh, it's pretty much light all evening right now. So uh, yeah, uh, I think all I all I have to say is you just wait until no- <laughs> November and December rolls around. You you might have a very different opinion. Um, now, as you're still pretty new in Norway, Kevin, I'm going to be interested to hear your responses to the same three questions I ask almost every guest on the Life in Norway show. So some quick answers from you, please. What's the best thing so far about living in Norway? My favorite thing is the culture, uh, not only of embracing nature and, and uh, you know, looking to the outdoors for, for everything from family get togethers to dates to just, you know, uh, a relaxing afternoon. Um, but also the culture of community, of looking after each other, of, of taking care of everybody and not having a giant gap between rich and poor, uh, that people even working, you know, a convenience store clerk is, has a good life. And I really think that's special about Norway. And the most challenging thing that you've experienced so far? (laughs) Hopefully it doesn't affect my visa application, but it's going to be the immigration process. Uh, it's... I've often gotten three different answers for in the same conversation from the same person on what the rules are, or when I'll hear back or whatever. It's um, It shouldn't be this hard. Um, I think Norway can really benefit from the innovation that entrepreneurs, as we as you spoke about in your last podcast, uh, bring to a nation. And um, I'm trying to really um, come here to 
to bring more Americans and Canadians and really develop adventure travel in Norway. And also, uh, I also hope to bring uh, Scandinavians to the U.S. to show them our nature. And uh, it, it hopefully this will all work out and it'll be a lot easier. But I think that should that's a place that needs improvement in the future. And you've spoken about a couple of places in Norway already that you like particularly. But if I had to push you, where is that one place in Norway where you think, yep, this is my spot? So uh, it definitely is Jotunheim. And, and um, my favorite section is um, is up from the uh, Olavsbu hut going down to uh, Skugadalsbon. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um for my Norwegian critics out there, um, but it's just a it's just such a beautiful day of hiking, uh, a lot of change, and again you end at a fully uh, manned hut that has uh, great food and beer on tap. Fantastic, Kevin! Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure there will be some people now interested in in some adventure travel in Norway. Where can they find out more about you and some of the tours you offer? So my company, again, is uh, International Adventure Guides, or IAG Adventures. Uh, our website is IAG Adventures, it's plural, dot com. Uh, we also have the domain live to explore dot com, so that I'll also send you to the website. Um, you'll find us on social media at IAG Adventures. And I've also, uh, I, written, I wrote a memoir that was published um, in 2021, uh, called duct tape and bailing wire, which is a, a very American expression of kind of barely holding, barely holding it together, which I think uh, all the fellow entrepreneurs out there can relate to. But um, uh, having been a, I flew jets in the Navy, you know, was on a guided missile frigate uh, with a gunboat unit during the war, and I have a, I've had a pretty interesting life from um, you know having to hide from the the mob in New York when my, my dad you know had to rob a bank to uh, pay a gambling debt to uh, starting a business in New York City as a street vendor serving the military and um, having adventures all over the world. So uh, duct tape and bailing wire, it's on um, Amazon. Uh, Barnes & Noble as well sells at a lot of bookstores in the U.S. And the website for my book is ducttape-bailingwire.com. And I'll include links to those difficult-to-spell URLs in the show notes page, uh, including some information about some of the things and places we've spoken about on the show today you'll be able to find that at lifeinnorway.net slash podcast kevin thanks so much for joining us today and happy travels thanks for the opportunity 